saying to pull the trigger to kill your son, you know, masturbates to memory. Love you. Nine one one. What are you reporting? Someone shooting at uh, Freeman High School. Someone shooting at Freeman High School? Yes, it sounds like somebody shooting at Freeman High School. This is Caleb Sharp. On September thirteenth, twenty seventeen, Caleb Sharp brought several weapons to Freeman High School and started shooting at his classmates. He killed one student, Sam Strawn, and wounded three girls. He also caused fear and panic among many others who witnessed the shooting. I started running and was so scared because I felt like I was running in slow motion. I began thinking, there's absolutely no way I'm getting out of this. Caleb Sharp was subsequently arrested and brought before the court to face the consequences of his actions. As if his crime was not outrageous enough, his reaction to his sentence was even more dramatic. I'm sorry to every single person I forced PTSD upon. I'm sorry to all the people who can't go out in public anymore. The mother of the late student, Amy Strawn, was in attendance with her daughter, Emily, and she and Sharp's other victims had some things to say to the killer of her child. As I lay there, I watched him walk by me with the most, most emotionless face I've ever seen, shooting at my classmates as they ran in fear of their lives into classrooms. The fact that Gracie survived is remarkable. The fact that she can walk is a miracle. In his defense, Brooke Foley, Sharp's public defender, argued that due to his age and immaturity at the time of the shooting, Sharp should be considered a youthful offender and receive a sentence below the standard range. You will hear that Caleb Sharp was an immature 15-year-old, that he had neurocognitive disorders, and his youthfulness should be the basis to find him less culpable for his criminal conduct. Foley requested a 20-year fixed sentence, but the judge did not agree. Lots of kids have ADHD, but they don't go shoot up a school and try to kill as many of their classmates as they can. The defendant, Caleb Sharp, in the state of Washington, <coughs> on or about September 13th, 2017, did intentionally assault. So the court would accept your plea today and would find you guilty as charged. Caleb Sharp pleaded guilty to premeditated murder and attempted murder and was sentenced to 40 years to life in prison, with credit for nearly five years served. Sharp will be in prison for at least the next 35 years, making him eligible for parole at age 55. However, let's compare the apologetic reaction of Caleb Sharp to the astonishing outburst by TJ Lane during their sentencing. TJ Lane is a teenager who shot up Chardon High School in Ohio on February 27, 2012. Chaos erupted at the school as multiple calls flooded the Ohio Police Department, reporting an active shooter within the premises. Chardon High School, we had shots fired, gun shots, multiple gun shots. Chardon High School, we need police up here. Was there someone in the building with a gun? According to police reports, Lane entered the school and proceeded to the cafeteria, where he opened fire, resulting in the tragic deaths of three students and severe injuries to three others. However, the emotional wounds inflicted on the Chardon High School community that day are immeasurable and will endure indefinitely. You see glances of your friends laying all over the place, there's blood, there's people screaming, everybody's running in different directions, and you're just trying to get out. Lane's actions sent shockwaves through the community, leading to his swift apprehension and subsequent charges. He was charged with three counts of aggravated murder, two counts of attempted aggravated murder, and one count of felonious assault. However, the real shocker came when Lane unleashed his madness in the courtroom. Lane showed no remorse during the trial, and he adamantly refused to cooperate with his attorneys. Instead, he brazenly appeared in court wearing a t-shirt bearing the word killer, and even extended his middle finger to the grieving families of the victims. During the sentencing hearing, this is what Lane had to say. Saying pull the trigger to kill your son, you know, masturbates to memory. Love you. This statement sparked outrage and disgust, not only among the victims' families, but also throughout the entire nation. Lane received three life sentences in prison, without the possibility of parole. Remarkably, he remained emotionless and unremorseful, showing no reaction when the sentence was pronounced. However, while T.J. Lane's behavior raised eyebrows, it's nothing compared to the actions of Ethan Crumbly during their trial. On November 30th, 2021, 15-year-old Ethan Crumbly, a student of Oxford High School in Michigan, carried out one of the state's most devastating school shootings. Armed with a loaded 9mm semi-automatic handgun that he had acquired just four days prior, Crumbly executed a horrifying plan he had detailed in his journal to commit the biggest school shooting in Michigan's history. Tragically, he turned this plan into reality, 
claiming the lives of three students and injuring eight others. I have two deaths. I have a kid standing next to the guy that got shot right in the back of the head so he could watch with the murderers saying right to him, lay down on the ground and go right next to him. If you thought Crumbly had reached the depths of depravity with his crimes, wait until you see their shocking behavior during the proceedings. Crumbly pleaded guilty to all charges, having been accused of taking the lives of four students and causing injuries to seven others, including a teacher. Now we're not willing to take that risk right now. I can't hear you. We're not taking that risk right now. Okay, well, come to the door and look at my bag, bro. No. Yeah, bro. He said bro. He said bro. Red flags. The emotional toll of Crumbly's actions was visible in the courtroom. Crumbly admitted to taking the lives of each victim, confirming their identities by name. You deliberately, with the intent to kill, and with premeditation, use a 9mm handgun and shoot and kill Miss Madison Baldwin. And shoot and kill Mr. Tate Meyer. And shoot and kill Miss Hannah St. Julian. And shoot and kill Mr. Justin Schilling. He confessed to retrieving the gun used in the shooting from an unlocked container in his home on the day of the incident. Crumbly revealed that he had concealed the weapon in his backpack and later used it in a bathroom to carry out the attack. Is it true that while inside the boy's bathroom, in the stall of the bathroom, you removed the handgun from your backpack? Yes. Is it true that you ensured that the handgun was loaded? Yes. Is it true that you exited the bathroom approximately 12.51 p.m. on November the 30th, 2021? Yes. Is it true that when you exited the bathroom, you began shooting at students and staff members of the Oxford High School? Yes. Contradicting his parents' claims that the gun was securely stored, Crumbly stated that he had given his father money to purchase the firearm he used in the mass shooting, and that it was easily accessible. The bathroom began shooting, moved through hallways, back through hallways, and was apprehended in the hallway. Crumbly now faces the possibility of life in prison without the chance of parole. Despite his lack of emotion during the plea bargaining, his attorney, Lofton, had considered an insanity defense, but after the hearing, she concluded that it was challenging and that her client had chosen to plead guilty instead. Why did you change the plea? Uh, originally, we filed a notice of insanity, and based on the conversations that we've had and the review of the discovery, uh, we felt it appropriate to withdraw that and have him plead guilty today. However, Crumbly isn't alone in their courtroom actions. Let's not forget the infamous incident involving 19-year-old Nicholas Cruz. My name is Nick, and I'm going to be the next school shooter of 2018. My goal is at least 20 people with an AR-15 and a couple tracer rounds. I think I can do good done. You're all going to die. Who carried out a mass shooting at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida on February 14th, 2018. Cruz, a former student of the school, unleashed a barrage of gunfire on students and staff, resulting in the tragic loss of 17 lives. He fled the scene, but was apprehended in Coral Springs about an hour later. Going on today, bro? Demons, man. Demons? Voices. This senseless act of violence became the deadliest high school shooting in U.S. history. The Broward County Sheriff's Office was criticized for its handling of the police response. They were faulted for not acting on multiple warnings about Cruz and for choosing to wait outside the school rather than confronting him immediately. During the trial, Cruz showed no remorse, even laughing at one point. On October 20th, 2021, Cruz pleaded guilty to all charges. The prosecution had sought the death penalty, but the jury ultimately proposed a life sentence in prison without the possibility of release. The survivors and the families of the victims gave heartbreaking and furious testimony. During the sentence, Cruz finally found his humanity and apologized for his crimes. And I love you, and I know you don't believe me, but I have to live with this every day, and it brings me nightmares, and I can't live with myself sometimes, but I try to push through because I know that's what you guys would want me to do. Finally, on November 2nd, 2022, after numerous delays, Nicholas Cruz received a life sentence without parole in accordance with Florida law, which mandates that the court adhere to the jury's recommendation. However shocking Nicholas Cruz's reaction to his sentence was, how does it compare to the reaction of 14-year-old Barry Lucatus, who shot up Frontier Middle School in Moses Lake, Washington, USA, on February 2nd, 1996? He was armed with a hunting rifle and two handguns, all of which belonged to his father. Lucatus took the lives of his algebra teacher and two of his fellow students. He also held his classmates hostage until a courageous gym coach managed to subdue him. Saw this guy uh, with a gun. Unfortunately, he got another round off before I could grab him. 
Lucatus came from a troubled home and his parents divorced in 1996. Psychologists hired by the defense believed that Larry Lucatus may have been suffering from depression or bipolar disorder. At the same time, Dr. Alan Yunus, a professor of psychiatry and behavioral sciences at the University of Washington and a prosecution witness, diagnosed him with dysthymic disorder. The Spokane Court of Appeals was divided on whether they should try Lucatus as an adult or a juvenile. Eventually, they decided to try him as an adult. In July, Judge Evan Spurline allowed court-appointed psychiatrist Joan Petrick to present testimony regarding Lucatus' mental health. However, due to the intense media attention, the trial was moved from Spokane to Seattle, Washington. While the magnitude of Lucatus' crimes is daunting, their courtroom behavior will leave you in disbelief. All of you are good people, and hell is knowing that you have done something to good people and that they can, that you can never, you can never make it right. During the legal proceedings, Lucatus showed no remorse. He pleaded insanity on all charges, but was sentenced to life imprisonment. However, in 2012, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that individuals convicted of committing capital crimes when they're under 18 cannot receive automatic life sentences without the possibility of parole. This policy was applied in 2016. In a resentencing in 2017, Lucatus offered his first apology, acknowledging his weakness and poor judgment. He was ultimately sentenced to 189 years in prison. However, just when you think you've seen it all, another convict surpasses Lucatus' strange courtroom display. Enter 18-year-old Devin Erickson and 16-year-old Alec McKinney, who caused a horrifying event in 2019 when they shot up STEM School Highlands Ranch in Douglas County, Colorado. I believe we share equal responsibility for everything that happened. Why? No one tried to stop anyone. Um, no one forced anyone into this. We were both mutually agreeing. Armed with multiple weapons concealed in a guitar case, Erickson and McKinney entered the school and unleashed a barrage of random gunfire on unsuspecting students. Amidst this chaos, a hero emerged in the form of fellow student Kendrick Ray Castillo. Castillo bravely confronted Erickson, seeking to stop the rampage. But tragically, he was fatally shot in the chest during this heroic act. McKinney was tackled to the ground by an armed security guard. Both shooters were apprehended, bringing an end to their terrifying assault. In total, eight people were injured in the ordeal, and Kendrick Castillo's heroic sacrifice saved the lives of numerous innocent individuals. As if Erickson and McKinney's offenses weren't enough, their demeanor in court will leave you dumbfounded. Erickson and McKinney were charged with a staggering 48 counts, including first-degree murder. Devin Erickson, who was 18 years old at the time of the attack, faced a life sentence without the possibility of parole. In June, he was convicted on 46 charges, including the murder of Kendrick Castillo. Alec McKinney, who was underage during the shooting, received a different sentence. He was sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole after serving 40 years. Both students remained cold and unmoved by the sentence. However shocking, Erickson and McKinney's reaction to their sentence was, how does it compare to the reaction of 14-year-old Michael Carneal, who, on December 1st, 1997, carried out a disastrous shooting at Heath High School in West Paducah, Kentucky? I said gunfire. Where's the shot? Where? In the lobby. Where? In the lobby of the, in the high, lobby high school? Of the high school. Ma'am, right. is anyone injured? I think so. Michael Carneal brought three guns to school, hidden under a blanket and in his backpack. He pretended that the blanket-covered guns were an art project and asked his sister to help him carry them. He arrived at school around 7.45 a.m. and joined a group of students who were praying in the lobby. He put earplugs in his ears and took out a 22 caliber pistol from his backpack. He then opened fire on the unsuspecting students, killing three girls and wounding five others. He stopped shooting when the school principal confronted him and asked him to hand over the gun. He surrendered without resistance and was arrested by the police. The shooting shocked and devastated the school community and the victims' families. I'm forced to continue with every day getting harder and harder as the years pass. He's now an adult in prison serving time for the actions of a child. I have to think that after 25 years, he is a different person than he was that day. Carneal had no apparent motive for his violent act, but he later revealed that he had been bullied by some of his classmates and suffered from mental health problems. It is something that is inside my mind. This is produced by my mind. He believed that someone was watching him through vents and windows and that he had to cover them up. He also heard voices in his head that told him to do things. After the shooting, he was evaluated by mental health experts who diagnosed him with schizophrenia. While the magnitude of Carneal's crimes is daunting, 
Their courtroom behavior will leave you in disbelief. In October 1998, Carneal, due to his mental illness, entered a guilty plea in a court hearing. The judge accepted the plea under the condition that Carneal would be sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole in 25 years. Carneal expressed remorse for his actions, acknowledging that, at the time of the shooting, he only considered himself and failed to grasp the harm and devastation he would cause. He underwent therapy and received medication while in prison, which helped stabilize his mental health. However, his chances of parole became uncertain when he testified that he still hears voices in his head, similar to the ones that had driven him to open fire in December 1997. Despite the violent nature of his actions, Carneal described himself as not inherently violent. It makes me feel terrible that I hurt anybody. I mean, my friends or not my friends or anybody, you know, I mean, it makes me feel terrible that I did that to anybody at all. However, while Carneal's actions can be attributed to mental illness, his reaction pales in comparison to the unfathomable behavior of Evan Ramsey. Got onto the bus, went to school, took the shotgun out of the, out of my pants in the Arctic entryway. Went around the corner, shot into the crowd. On February 19, 1997, a school shooting took place at Bethel Regional High School in Bethel, Alaska. The shooter, 16-year-old Evan Ramsey, was a student who had a troubled life at home and at school. He had been bullied by some of his peers and had a history of depression and suicidal thoughts. He decided to take revenge on those who had tormented him. I come home from school one day and I got tired of being picked on. I decided I got to do something. I need to stand up for myself. In a cold and calculated manner, Ramsey opened fire on a group of unsuspecting students. His first shot hit Joseph Palacios, a 15-year-old sophomore, in the abdomen. Palacios died instantly. Ramsey then shot two more students, who both survived but suffered serious injuries. Ramsey continued to walk around the school, looking for more targets. You're standing approximately where Ivan was. He was moving, and I said, give me the gun. When I said that one time, he pointed it at me, and that's when he said, do you really want this gun? He encountered Ron Edwards, the school principal, who tried to stop him. Ramsey shot him in the chest, killing him on the spot. He then went to the common area, where he exchanged fire with police officers who had arrived at the scene. There was a shot that was, the gun uh, went off on its own when I was at the stairwell, and it fired into a locker. The police officer fired a shot back at me. It was at the moment that I got shot at that I changed my mind. I had yelled, I don't want to die, and I threw the shotgun down, and then the police apprehended me. Ramsey was not hit by any bullets, but he realized that he did not want to die anymore. While the magnitude of Ramsey's crimes is daunting, his courtroom behavior will leave you in disbelief. Ramsey was arrested and charged with two counts of first-degree murder, three counts of attempted murder, and 15 counts of assault. He was tried as an adult and found guilty on all charges. Do you cry for the people who died? Do you cry for yourself? Someone, but I just wish that I hadn't done that. He was sentenced to 210 years in prison, but his sentence was later reduced to two life terms of 99 years each on appeal. He will be eligible for parole in 2066, when he will be 82 years old. However, when emotions run high in court, the actions of Ramsey and Demetrios Pogordis leave us questioning sanity itself. More shots fired, additional shots fired. They're having a shooting at the high school, have an officer down, shooter not in custody. Demetrios Pogordis, a 17-year-old student, killed 10 people and wounded 13 others in a school shooting in Santa Fe High School in Texas. One of the most heinous attacks that we've ever seen in the history of Texas school. Pogortzis used a shotgun and a revolver that he had taken from his father's closet to open fire on an art class at 7.32 a.m. He was confronted by two school resource officers and exchanged gunfire with them, injuring one of them. He eventually surrendered to police after hiding in a closet for about 30 minutes. He had posted pictures of his weapons and a t-shirt with the slogan, Born to Kill. He first opened fire with a shotgun in which he shot one of my other friends in the head and her body fell down not too far away from where I was under the table. That is when he turned like this and opened fire with the revolver. So he had two guns? He had two guns, yes hand. sir. A sawed off shotgun and then a revolver. He claimed that he had been bullied by some students and coaches at the school, but the school denied these allegations. One of his former teachers described him as quiet but not creepy and said that he never showed any signs of violence or aggression in his class. A classmate 
had this to say. Music, making jokes while he's doing it, had like slogans, like rhymes and stuff he kept what was, saying. What was he saying? Like every time he'd kill someone, he'd say another one bites the dust. Pogortsis was charged with capital murder of multiple people and aggravated assault against a public servant. He was held without bond at the Galveston County Jail. Because he was a minor at the time of the shooting, he could not face the death penalty or life without parole. He faces a maximum sentence of life imprisonment with the possibility of parole after 40 years if convicted. He appeared calm and emotionless in court, answering every question without hesitation. Students organized a candlelight vigil to honor the victims on the same day of the shooting. Ten white crosses were placed in front of the school to memorialize the deceased. The family of Pogortzis released a statement expressing their condolences to the victims and thanking the first responders for their help. However, just when you thought you'd seen it all, another convict surpasses Pogortzis' courtroom display. Shut up! You shut up. What are you going to do? Shut up! Keep following me and I'm going to you up. Enter Andy Williams. On March 5th, 2001, a tragic shooting took place at Santana High School in Santee, California. The shooter was Charles Andrew Williams, a 15-year-old student who had recently moved from Maryland. According to some reports, Williams had been bullied and harassed by other students at Santana High School. He also tried to talk to a school counselor a few weeks before the shooting, but was turned away because the office was too busy. He had told some of his friends about his plan to shoot up the school, but they thought he was joking. He had also intended to commit suicide by cop, but changed his mind at the last moment. Williams began his rampage in the boys' bathroom, where he shot and killed Brian Zucor, a 14-year-old freshman. He then walked out of the bathroom and fired randomly at other students and staff members, wounding 13 people and killing Randy Gordon, a 17-year-old senior. Williams returned to the bathroom several times to reload his weapon and continue shooting. He was confronted by a group of police officers, who had arrived at the scene within minutes of the first shots. Williams dropped his gun and surrendered peacefully, saying, it's only me. Williams was later convicted of two counts of first-degree murder and 13 counts of attempted murder. His father had this to say. I do not condone what he did. I do not condone the way he went about trying to resolve his issues whatsoever. He made a very bad choice. I can't change that. He was sentenced to 50 years to life in prison with the possibility of parole after 50 years. He is currently serving his sentence at Ironwood State Prison in Blythe, California. If you thought these reactions were shocking, you'd be amazed at this video of dangerous killers who wanted the death penalty.